Now, chances are, if you've ever been amazed by special effects in a film, our next guest probably had something to do with it. While working on some amazing films like The Abyss, Ghostbusters, Spider-Man 2, he has transformed raw elements, cutting-edge technology and pure thought into mind-boggling creations. What an intro. I'm telling you, that's what you were talking about. Multi Emmy Award winning Hollywood special effects artist Steve Johnson is currently in Dublin doing a 10 day <clears throat> workshop with the makeup crew, Makeup School. But Steve has kindly taken time out of his busy schedule to join us now to talk about his new autobiography, Rubberhead, Sex, Drugs and Special Effects. Steve, you're so welcome Morning. along to the show. We were chatting about everything you've done, and this is Autobiography's volume one of five because you've that much to talk about. It's because I can never shut my mouth. <laughs> I mean, if you know me personally, people are like, five volumes but yeah I could go on for 10 volumes and so I suppose there's such an appetite in terms of the heyday the glory days of the 80s prior to CGI yes so things are done differently nowadays but students would be learning like the gang of the makeup crew what happened back in the 80s when you didn't have the luxury of computerization that's exactly right I don't know if I would call it a luxury I'd call it more of a curse Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is there, there's a huge kind of nostalgia for these handmade creations that we did back in the 80s and in the 90s and that's one of the reasons I wrote this is because I almost felt like it was a responsibility because a hundred years from now people aren't really gonna know what we used to do because everything as and we know, how you did it more importantly well that's true there's a lot of pictures in the book too so it's, yeah. it's kind of an art book as well as a memoir but it, it will serve as a window for generations to come to see how we used to do this stuff because we know we're all gonna turn into robots in the next hundred years but anyway. it's interesting that you say you talk about it being a curse is in terms of the industry Ch the changes in the industry from even 20 years ago. It's staggering, really, in terms of special effects and what they can do and can do, isn't it? It is. It's unbelievable, and it's going to keep going. I mean, look what they just did in the new Star Wars movie. They're yeah. making digital actors at this point. So even I'm actors... I'm with that news. Yeah. Yeah. It's fantastic. <laughs> actors' days are numbered, not just my profession. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Thanks You're for welcome. coming in, my friend. <laughs> But can you take us back to when you were a child? Because it's such a niche profession. Obviously, there was a serious creative streak in you. When did you decide this is something I could actually make a career out of? I came out of the womb wanting to do this, literally. <laughs> I mean, from my, my first memories, you know, from the old Universal horror movies, Frankenstein, Dracula, to the, the Hammer movies, um, I figured out somebody had to be doing this stuff, and why not me? Yeah. So how did you get started? What was the first step towards a career in it? Well... In 1976, one of the first horror and sci-fi conventions was being conducted in Houston, where I grew up in Texas, and Rick Baker was speaking there. And Rick Baker has like, yeah. more Oscars than he has millions at this point, like nine Oscars for Best Makeup and Visual Effects, from The Grinch to Harry and the Hendersons to Star Wars, you name it. And I literally, when I was 16 years old, I begged my mom to drive me down there, and I had my little portfolio under my arm. And after he spoke, I actually went up to him and said, Mr. Baker, will you, will you look at my work? Will you look at my work? And uh, he did, and he gave me his number. He said, hey, if you ever make it out to Hollywood, kid, give me a call. Really? Yeah, so when I, I, I graduated high school, drove straight out to his front door and knocked on his door, and he's like, who the hell are you? <laughs> and you're like, I'm, I'm here. You don't remember me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm the guy <laughs> with the portfolio. That was me. Uh, looking at the mm. list of directors that you've worked with, um, insane last year, Del Torvo, and then we also have James Cameron, one of my favorites, but he gave you kind of an insane brief for The Abyss, and it was sort of, he wanted these beautiful creations and you had to transfer what it was in his mind onto the screen. How did that process work? He wanted me to do something impossible and I was a kid, this was in the late 80s, I mean I was like in maybe in my mid-twenties then and he, when he came to me he said I want you to create the most beautiful ethereal image ever put on film. I want these aliens to be glass clear, I want them to self-illuminate, change colors, light up like a Las Vegas casino sign and I want to shoot them underwater. Can you do it? Same. And I'm like... You said, give me 20 minutes. No, I just said, sure, I'll do it. Because the, the whole nature of this business is you have to stand at the edge of the cliff and just jump and know the shoot will open. So, so let's talk about that process then. So where, where do you start? And I, I, we were, remember, we were kids just making stuff up. Yeah, so yeah. there were no clear, flexible cell phones <clears> back then. There, there was, most importantly, there was no digital fallback. So if we... A bunch of kids in, in a studio in, in Van Nuys, California, could not pull off the climax of this film. There was no digital fallback. The movie would not have been able to be released. So, I mean, talk about pressure. Yeah. So we just started testing because we didn't have a final design. So we tried everything and nothing worked. If it was clear, it wouldn't self-illuminate. If it self-illuminated, it wouldn't work underwater. On and on and on. I literally sat in my office on a sofa just like this day after day 
trying to figure out the most painless way to kill myself because <laughs> I knew this wasn't going to work. And if I didn't kill myself, Cameron was going to do it. Anyway. Cameron was going to do it. Exactly. But then t tell us about the Eureka moment, like when you when you went, "Hey, this is it. This is it. This works." Fiber optics. Fiber ah. optics. And you know, once you figure it out, it seems so <clears throat> obvious. Like, why didn't I think of that first? But we have some other creations of yours. Uh, you worked in American Werewolf in London, uh, Arachnid as well, Spider-Man 2, my kids love. But the favourite for, for us in our family at the moment, and, and my little one's birthday was last week, and he got Slime and Slimer. I mean, <laughs> Slimer from Ghostbusters yeah. is an iconic uh -huh. character, you could call it. It is. And was the best part of the movie because of the way it interacted with the actors. And still today, we're talking 30 years on, five and six-year-olds are talking about Slimer. Well, that's your they're legacy. Gonna, they're going to wheel me out on a stage when I'm not... 98 years old, and ask me, to what do you attribute the enduring quality of Slimer? <laughs> I've had it with Slimer. Cops pull me over for speeding. I say, hey, I made Slimer. Oh, why didn't you say so? Let me know. That's great. <laughs> but it was, a, it was a smi an evil smile you started with for him. You it? know the funny part about Slimer, and it's, it's in the book, don't forget. <laughs> uh, there's a story about the creation, which is that I was not the only person doing drugs back then. That whole movie was fueled by cocaine. But Makes the, a lot of the, sense. The funny thing about Slimer, and not a lot of people know this, is it's literally literally based on John Belushi from Animal House. Really? Oh. John Belushi was supposed to play the role of Peter Vinkman yeah. before he died. Yeah. And so uh, Dan Aykroyd and Harold Ramis wrote him into the script as a ghost, a fat glutton of a ghost. Isn't that weird? So they were like making me like, make it look like like this John Belushi. I'm like, it's a smile with arms. How can I make it look like John Belushi? <laughs> Fox ticking, guys. I love it. Um, <clears throat> you kind of threw in the towel, gave it all up, got disgusted with life in Hollywood, and ended up living in the jungle in Costa Rica. And that's not as making things do. up. Yeah, as you do. That's you, a film in itself. <laughs> I mean, it's just kind of your mouth is on the floor reading about your life. Uh, oh, so what, you read the book? I, well, I read <laughs> your bio. <laughs> it's pretty long. <laughs> but in terms of shutting yourself away from something you loved and taking time out for yourself. How did that process go for you? It was amazing because it, it was a, a period of reinvention. You know, I, I abandoned all my belongings, sold them, auctioned them, and turned off my phone, turned off the computer, and went down there. And the goal was, I mean, I didn't have a, a definite time to stay there, but I just wanted to heal. I mean, I'd been in the lion's den, Hollywood, yeah. for 30 years. I had to lick my wounds and go back in the cave. And I said, I'm going to write. I've, I'd always wanted to write. Because writing, I've found, is kind of like sculpting, but with words, because you're creating images, but in people's minds instead yeah. of as Slimer and as a you know, foam rubber puppet. And I just reinvented myself, and I, wanted, <clears throat> I said, I'm not going to leave this jungle until I've learned how to write a book. And so I wrote a sprawling, nonsensical, 1,000-page book that will never be published, but it was my master's thesis, mm -hmm. and so I learned. Okay. And now, therefore, my new work is actually good. And it is published. Don't forget, kids. <laughs> Got it here. Sex, drugs, special effects. And you're back in Hollywood now, mm. and you have embraced CGI because you would be a consultant in so many movies now, a sort of the master, bringing what you've learned in the past into the future with the help of the young guns coming up who would be all into CGI but wouldn't have your experience. Right. Well, exactly. I mean, now we can do things so much more easily with the help of CGI that we couldn't do before. So it's kind of an uneasy marriage between the two. But it's getting there. Yeah. Well, I wanted to talk to you about one of my favourite movies, Bicentennial Man. <clears throat> but we can't because we're out of time. Damn. <laughs> Just I stay know, for man. the morning. Hang Bicentennial. around, have some more dessert. We're going to cook more we dessert. Can, we can talk even. Let's cut the cameras. Cool, let's, let's do talking. that. <laughs> it's, been, it's been a pleasure. Dude, it's been, been a, a pleasure. pleasure. Let me tell you where to get the book. <laughs> we'll have it my up on website, the website. You Steve have a new Johnson book. <laughs> Thanks so much, Steve, for coming in this All morning. Right,